So my name is Daniel Barrage. I'm going to talk to you today about OpenStack with a particular focus on Nova and uh, ABM. That's what most people here are going to be interested in. Uh, many of you will uh, know me from my work on um, Flipper in the past eight years or so, as well as contributions to many other specialization projects. Um, in the past year, I've also started doing work on OpenStack Nova. Um, and I've done quite a few patches to improve the KVM support in um, OpenStack and uh, became a core team reviewer for Nova um, in that time. So the structure of this talk, um, we're going to start off by giving a bit of an introduction to OpenStack and the various components and code names you might here mentioned. Um, then I'm going to look a little bit more at the architecture of Nova, which is the compute part of OpenStack. Um, and in doing that, I'm going to cover a simplified view of the guest boot sequence. And, and then towards the end of the talk, I'm just going to mention some of the recent developments that came out in um, the new release of OpenStack that was last Thursday and what will be coming in the next uh, six months. So what is, what is OpenStack? Um, it is really a set of software for doing either public or private cloud deployments. Um, so an end user, it consists of a self-service API and a dashboard, um, a choice of choice of methods for interacting with OpenStack. Um, a very permissive license, the Apache 2.0 license, and um, it has very broad community contribution from um, a huge range of companies and individuals. Um, I don't even know how many companies are involved anymore. There's, there's so many there. Um, so it's, it's a very popular project and moving very quickly indeed. So I'd like to just um, go through a couple of components of OpenStack. Because it is targeting such a broad range of functionality, um, the OpenStack project has been split up into a number of self-contained components, each focusing on a, a particular functional area. Um, and each of these components has a code name, which you often hear people refer to it by. Um, so the most interesting from our point of view is the compute service which is typically known as Nova. Um, and supporting the compute service, we have a networking service called Neutron. Um, image storage, which is where um, your basic operating system disk images are, are maintained. Um, block storage, which is for providing persistent block devices to guests. Um, and then a couple of other things, which I'm not really going to cover in this talk. I just mentioned here for completeness object storage, identity, which is with authentication, really, um, metering, which um, allows administrators to find out what users are consuming and thus do billing for them. Um, orchestration is a way of um, simplifying your management of instances by putting together recipes, automatically deploying sets of images a complete application service and the dashboard, which is the graphical user interface um, web front end. But I'm, I'm only going to talk about the first four things in this talk because there's not nearly enough time to cover everything. So what is Nova? Nova is basically the compute service. So it's the thing that is concerned with running your virtual machines or, or operating system instances. Um, it's actually technology agnostic. It's, it's quite happy doing full machine-based virtualization or container-based virtualization. Um, but to be honest, most of the usage these days is full machine virtualization. The kind of container stuff is there, but there's not very many people using it at this point in time. Um, but I think that'll probably change, change over time. Um, it's also virtualization agnostic. There's, um, there's a plug of 
all virtualization layerings like Nova um, with many different implementations. Um, the LibWorth implementation is obviously the one that I'm most interested in. Um, and the LibWorth implementation provides the KVM and QMU functionality in Nova. Um, there's also drivers for um, LXC, which is Linux containers, um, Zen, and um, even user mode Linux, but no one really uses that anymore. So I left it off the slide. Aside from the LibVirt driver, there is um, a Zen API, Zen API driver, Hyper-V, VMware, um, PowerVM, uh, which is a higher level container API based on LXC, and even a bare metal driver. Um, I think the bare metal driver is quite interesting. It shows the kind of direction um, that OpenStack is going in to ex expand its scope. It's kind of traditionally, we've had just the, bare metal, just the bare metal data center world. Then we had kind of the data center virtualization, and now we've got cloud. Well, OpenStack started out as a cloud solution. You can see it's expanding into the bare metal area there. Um, I think over time, you'll see OpenStack pick up a lot of the kind of data center vert features as well, so it'll expand to cover all aspects of um, machine management, whether it's bare metal, data center vert, or cloud vert. Right, um, so looking at the image service next. Um, the image service is known by the code name Plants. Um, and this is basically providing what I, I tend to refer to as write once, read many storage of images. So a user will create a, a disk image using some appliance building tools, and then upload that image into, into OpenStack. And that'll be, that'll be stored by Glance. And then when Nova comes along and wants to actually boot an instance of that image, it will copy the data out of Glance into um, some storage that Nova manages. So from the point of view of the image service, it's just read-only there, basically. Um, Glance itself is agnostic to the format of the disk images. Um, so you can upload any type of disk image to Glance, whether it's raw, UCAL, DMDK, or whatever. It never really looks inside the disk images, so it doesn't care what format they're in. Um, the constraints on the format are imposed by the computer, which is actually running the images. Um, as well as uploading the images, the um, other interesting thing you can do is metadata properties for the image. And this is useful if you want to um, give OpenStack a bit of information about um, what the image requires um, to be able to run. So the, the, the simplest example is, well, what disk driver does it need? Does it need IDE or does it need VertIO? Um, so that's one of the metadata properties you can set. Um, there's a bunch of other metadata properties which I'll mention. The second type of storage component in OpenStack is known as Cinder, and this provides um, persistent block devices for the instances. Um, it's um, it is really transient. It's, it's copied out of glance into the compute service when you put the instance, when the instance shuts down. Away again. So you might have some data that's preserved across both attempts. And that's where Cinder comes in, because it provides system block devices for your instances. And um, as with everything in the OpenStack world, it's very pluggable. So there's multiple backends for Cinder. It can store its data in LVM volumes, in RBD volumes, in cluster FS, um, and in a whole range of other backends, which I can't remember off the top of my head, because they're changing all the time. Typically, the, the block service runs on a separate host to the actual um, virtualization hosts. So the, the block devices are exposed to the virtualization host using iSCSI, typically. Um, but one of the most recent developments is actually making it possible for the virtualization hosts to directly connect to the 
actual storage and just taking ICLD out of the loop. And this has now been implemented by cluster FS in the most recent release of OpenStack. Um, but I expect that all this feature will also um, come into other network based um, storage like RBD. Um, and the, the persistence, use of persistent block storage is also a prerequisite for migrating VMs um, between hosts. Um, the, the third, well, the fourth um, part of OpenStack that I wanted to mention here is the networking service. Um, this is now known by the name Neutron. Um, they provide management of the physical network um, using a couple of concepts. It has the concept of a network, router, subnets, um, and also the idea of um, ports. The ports are what the virtual machine network interface is connected into. Um, and again, this is highly pluggable, so there are a wide variety of different networking technologies that are plugged into Neutron. Um, some of the most, more common ones are OpenV switch. There's actually several plugins based on OpenV switch, um, depending on the vendor technology behind it. There's the traditional Linux bridge. And there's a whole bunch of um, vendor-specific network technologies that are in there as well. So that, that was um, a very quick overview of some of the core components um, in OpenStack. And I want to um, go into a little bit more about the Nova architecture, because that's the compute layer or hypervisor layer, which is the bit that people here are probably most interested in. So there are a couple of um, core concepts in Nova. There's instances, which is the Nova terminology for a virtual machine. Um, flavors. Flavor is basically just a collection of properties which define the characteristics of the virtual machine. So a flavor will say how many virtual CPUs it has, how much memory it gets, whether there's a um, swap disk for the instance, how big the root disk image will be, and a handful of other properties. Um, so it's just a convenient way of, of setting up a bunch of hardware defaults for a virtual machine. Um, Nova, has Nova has multiple vert drivers, as I mentioned earlier, um, KVM, QMU, Hyper-V, VMware. Um, and it also has security groups. Um, the security group is something that's applied at the network level. Uh, if isolation between different virtual machines um, that are attached to the same network. And this is um, done with a combination of IP tables and EB tables um, just to filter the guest network traffic um, so that isolates them from each other. Now, Nova um, is controlled. Um, by two different REST APIs. There's the um, OpenStack native REST API for Nova, um, and this exposes all of the Nova functionality that there is. And then there is also an Amazon EC2 compatible REST API, um, which is obviously useful if you have some management tools, which already know the EC2 API. You can just point them at your know, OpenStack Nova instance, and they should more or less work. Um, but they won't necessarily expose the full range of functionality that the OpenStack native API does, just because if you're implementing the EC2 API, you're constrained by what Amazon has defined the um, operations to be. <clears throat> so each, each um, component within OpenStack is in, in turn comprised of several different services. Um, so in, in Nova, there's probably four important services. There's a couple more on the side, which I don't mention here. But the, the important ones are shown, are shown here. Um, Nova API is where the end user comes in, making that REST API calls. And it takes the REST API calls and either adds information to the database, or it puts RPC messages on 
through a message bus with um, AMCP typically. The scheduler component, this is responsible for deciding which host the virtual machine is going to run on. The conductor component is typically in charge of updating the state when things change in, um, in the cluster. And the network computer component is actual virtualization host is that host of virtualization technology that lived as in ABM. So that's the very simple um, architecture. You typically, each one of these blue boxes is a separate process, typically running on separate hosts. Of course, you, if you want to scale this up, you're going to actually want to run multiple of these, of these components. In that case, you'd put a load balancer on the front, so your REST APIs come in, and a load balancer will spread the load across multiple instances of the API service. And you can, of course, have multiple instances of each other. Um, this gives you a way to scale out uh, an individual deployment to, um, to meet your um, usage requirements. You've still only got one database and um, one message bus instance. So what if you want to go a bit large and just adding more services isn't going to help? Well, there was a, in, the, um, in the Grizzly release, which is um, the most recent part one, there was um, the concept of cells introduced. Um, and the idea of the cell architecture is that we want to be able to partition our deployment into multiple um, isolated components. There are a couple of reasons you want to do this. You might want to have resilience within your data center so that if you have a fault with some part of um, the service, you don't take out your entire data isolated to one little part. Um, more common one is you want to actually spread your, your cloud across multiple data centers. Or the third possibility is you just want to um, have it for ease of management. So you want to say have a Hyper-V based cloud and you want to have an ABM based cloud. And you just want to have them in a separate um, cell for ease of management. So there are a couple of the reasons for this feature um, being introduced. So if you're making use of cells, um, the architecture looks something like this. You have the API cell, which is where the um, end user requests come in. And then that decides which of the actual compute cells to send the request onto. The compute cell just contains all the, all the um, parts that I mentioned a couple of slides back, the scheduler, conductor, compute service. Um, all that changed is we have a slightly different API block here. But basically, the architecture is the same as um, a non-cell-based deployment. And um, the API cell is just a load balancer, a couple of over API instances, and then a, an, another um, cell-specific um, service. This, this allows you to scale open stack up to really enormous, um, enormous numbers of virtualization hosts and, and users and stuff. So now I want to talk a little bit more about um, some of the individual Nova services. I mentioned the scheduler a couple of um, slides back. This is um, a fairly simple service. It only really has um, one job. And that job is to decide which virtualization host to put the virtual machines on. Um, and yet again, this is highly pluggable. And it's, plug it's pluggable using this notion of filters. Um, there are a whole range of filters that are in the OpenStack source tree. Um, I just picked out a, a very small number of them here just to give you an idea of the kind of things that they do. Um, so you can have filters which look at the CPU model or architecture. If you want to run a VM and say six people post, and your your cluster may have a cloud may have a mixture um, um, and it can be six people host. So you need the scheduler to know which host to place the virtual machine on. Um, 
optimization time. It's got a mixture of um, KVM and Hyper-V, and the image that you're booting has particular requirements for one the technology you know, place it on the right host for that. Also, we can add features with the ability to do PCA PCI type assignments. Um, so the scheduler has to know host at which PCI device is available, and then pick the right one to assign the guest to. Um, simple um, performance-based metrics, so considering available RAM, available CPU cycles, um, disk usage, and, and so on. You can even have, um, take account of whether the host is running in a trusted boot environment or not. And there's probably about um, 15 or more other filters in the Nova source tree that do various things, which I don't, I don't know about because there's, there's so many of them and they're changing all the time. Um, So the next, the next um, service in Nova is known as the Conductor. Um, this is another fairly recent introduction. I think it came in the Grizzly cycle, which was previous release plus one. And the idea here is to mediate database access. The original OpenStack um, compute architecture had each virtualization host updating the database when a change occurred in the VM state. Um, and this is very quickly found to be a performance bottleneck because you have just one database server and you have many thousands or even tens of thousands of virtualization hosts. And you really don't want that many hosts all updating the database at once. Um, the second reason why this was introduced was as a security um, improvement. Um, the virtualization hosts are probably part of the OpenStack architecture. So you want to, you want to constrain what the virtualization host can do. So you really don't want the virtualization host to have to the database because they can create all sorts of havoc there. The idea of the conductor service was introduced. Um, so now when a compute host has a state change in its central um, update core, it just puts a message onto the QP um, message bus. The conductor picks up this message, validates that it's actually a sane thing to do, and then updates the database um, state. This, this was a very big performance win, um, as well as a security benefit. <clears throat> One of the boxes that I didn't have on the architecture slide um, was the graphics proxy. Um, there are two ways to interact with virtual machines um, in OpenStack, either a graphical console or a text-based serial console. A serial console is fine for um, Linux or BSD operating systems, but Windows administrators really want to have a graphical console to their, to their virtual instance. Um, so OpenStack has the ability to expose either VNC or Spice um, connections to the virtual instances, um, but we don't want to expose the individual virtualization hosts to the um, public internet. So there was this idea of a graphics proxy introduced. And this runs on a public facing host, and it speaks a WebSockets protocol. Um, so basically, it tunnels VNC or Spice over WebSockets, and it proxies all the data between the public internet and the actual compute host. Um, and this is also where um, the authentication comes in. Um, when, when a user wants to get access to the graphical console for their virtual instance, they make an API call and say, oh, console, and if they access that virtual instance, they get back an authentication token. And when making a connection to the WebSockets proxy, and that validates the token and says, um, the token also encodes which um, allowed to connect to. So the proxy can then forward to the correct virtualization host and the correct virtual instance on that host. Um, so you've got this extra service in the middle there, basically copying the data between the actual 
um, VMC or Spice client and the compute hosts. Um, the one implication of having this proxy in the middle is that you can't actually use a regular VMC or Spice client. You have to use a client that knows the tunnel the data over web sockets. Um, and the OpenStack web dashboard, this is done using um, no VNC, HTML5 widgets, or the Spice HTML5 widgets. Um, it would be desirable to actually get some of the native desktop VNC and Spice plans to poke the WebSockets protocol, because that will just give you a bit better performance and um, give you access to some features um, with Spice. Um, Spice provides a lot of features of VNC. But if you're running a Spice client using HTML5 in the browser, you can't really take advantage of these Spice features. So it would be nice to have a native Spice client that can do web sockets. Now I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of the steps involved in booting a virtual machine instance in, in Nova. OpenStack as a whole. I've just drawn out boxes for each of the components in OpenStack that I mentioned earlier. Um, most of these aren't involved in this simple sequence. But if we start off, the user makes a request for the identity service. This is basically just authenticating themselves um, against OpenStack. They provide a username and password, and they'll get back an authentication token, which they can then use for talking to the other blocks in OpenStack. So once they're updated, they can make a request to boot an instance to the compute service. What does the compute service have to do? Well, the user tells them what image they want to, what OS image they want to boot um, their instance with. The compute service will first talk to the image service, and it will say, "Give me the." image for this, um, for this image, and it'll copy the data out of the image service and put it in some local storage on the virtualization host. The next thing that happens is we set up any system block devices that have been assigned to this virtual machine. Um, so this involves talking to the block service. And then, as you might imagine, the step after that is to talk to the network service to um, ask it to set up the network ports for connecting the virtual machine interfaces to. And once all those three steps are done, then the compute service can now talk to the hypervisor and actually boot the instance. That's a fairly simplified um, view of what goes on. There's, there's actually quite a, lot of, quite a lot of fine details in there, which I don't really have time to explain here. I probably wouldn't mean very much to you unless you're very familiar with the OpenStack code. Um, but those are, those are the, the uh, three key steps in booting a virtual machine instance. So you can see how the compute service um, depends on facilities provided by the other services in OpenStack. I just want to um, now mention some of the operational KVM capabilities. Nova makes use of. Um, one of the first things I did when starting work on, on um, OpenStack was to make it possible to configure the CPU model we use to run virtual instances. So that's quite important to get maximum performance out of AVM. So you now have the ability to specify whether instances are booted with a, a specific um, named um, CPU type. Um, say Westmere or Opteron G3 or, or one of the other named CPUs that QMU has. Um, or you can specify that you want to just copy the features that your host CPU has. Um, or the third option is to just pass through the CPU of the host um, completely unchanged. Although the latter option has some implications for live migration. Um, it will restrict where you can live migrate to. Um, the, next, the next two things um, that I did when um, starting work on, on Nova were to add support for configuring um, 
network interface models and disk bus types. Um, originally, Nova was hard coded to require Vertigo block or Vertigo net for all instances, unless you toggled a global conflict parameter. Um, that wasn't that wasn't very flexible. So we added the ability to tag individual images in the image service with a disk model or sorry, a network model or a disk bus type. So you, now you can um, select Vertigo net or E1000 or or any of the other um, network models that are relevant for KVM. And you can also choose between Vertio Block, um, SCSI, or IDE um, when you're when you're um, on disks. One of the recent features in the just release of the was PCI device assignments. Um, that's another um, another feature that's added. In KVM, every instance gets given two serial ports. One of these serial ports is just for capturing log messages from the virtual instance. And the other serial port is for the interactive text console. Um, as I mentioned before, you can set up a system log devices for um, your virtual machines. So you have you typically have the root disk, an optional swap partition. Um, you have something called a config drive, which is just a way to expose some metadata to the instance. So you can have um, zero or more persistent block devices. There's quite a few different disk config options we make use of. We expose some um, information to the guest using SM BIOS. So we tell the guest that it's running on an OpenStack cluster set up what version of OpenStack it's running on. Um, so those, those are a couple of things that um, guest software sometimes likes to have if it wants to do uh, checking your operating system install against your um, OS licenses or subscriptions. Um, that can be useful information. You can do limited CPU pinning. This is actually at the discretion of the host administrator only at the moment. The host administrator say we want to reserve this set of CPUs just for running Nova and Libvirt services and the set of CPUs for actually running the virtual machines. So I expect that will be made more flexible in the future. As already mentioned, you have a choice of VNC or SPICE. And, um, with Spice, you obviously have the option to enable the Spice guest agent, um, which wires up stuff like cut and paste, um, monitor sizing, and various other features that Spice has, which require a guest agent. Um, very recently, we also added the ability to enable the QMU guest agent. And this was to en uh, enable um, free and store operations when doing snapshots. We got a couple of um, clock parameters which we set to try and ensure reliable timekeeping. We have a bunch of um, scheduler disk and network tunables you can set. Um, I think these are at the discretion of host administrator only at the moment. So the final, the final two slides I want to um, look at are just. Um, a couple of the interesting new features that arrived in the most recent release. Um, every OpenStack release has its own code name. Um, so we've had, um, at the time I've been working on it, we've had some Grizzly and Havana. Havana is the most recent, most recent release that came out just last Thursday. And the next release in six months' time will be called Ice House. Um, so if you're if you're following OpenStack, you'll hear these code names mentioned everywhere. From the compute host point of view, um, some of the most interesting features I've, I've highlighted here, um, block storage migration. You'll recall that I mentioned the, the block storage part of OpenStack can store data using LVM, cluster effects, RPD, and, and so on. This, this block storage migration feature was about allowing, allowing it to move the system 
storage between different back ends, so I can move it from an LVM, um, an LVM volume onto an RVD volume, and it can do this whilst the guest is accessing this um, storage volume. We also added the ability for um, storing the root operating system images in RVD volumes. So I mentioned earlier that when we boot an instance, um, we copy the root OS image out of the image service and into the computer. Historically, we've got that in a system or an NFS file system, but we've now got the ability to store it in an RVD volume as well. But another thing I mentioned briefly earlier on is that we can now have QMU instances booting um, and pointing up storage directly. So instead of um, having iSCSI in the, in the middle there, um, we can just have the compute, we can just have QMU talking to the cluster of customers directly. And this was a good performance win by just taking out extra data that is involved in having iSCSI in the middle. We added support for the QMU guest agent, and this is used when we do snapshots of um, guest images. Um, we um, can use the freeze on the floor operations in the guest agent, which is what the guest operating system has its disk in a system state when we take the snapshots. <clears throat> and the final feature I'm going to mention here is PCI device assignments. You might wonder how you set by the time in a cloud environment. Um, I think this is probably a case of OpenStack expanding to cover more than just cloud environments. This is this is an example of where OpenStack is expanding to, to deal with data center virtualization use cases as well as cloud. And I think I think more of these type of features um, arise in Nova over over time. Um, I, I know that the people who did this were mostly interested in, in PCI device assignments used with um, network cards which have SRIOV. I just had a quick look through what I've proposed um, so far and pick out a few that I thought were interesting from a uh, virtualization point of view. VM ensemble, this is just a fancy way of saying we're going to have a way to group virtual machine instances. So if you want to boot up an application, this application may have virtual machines each doing different functions. Or you might want to be able to say, I want all of the virtual machines to run on the same physical host. Um, or firstly, you might want to say, I want um, these virtual machines to absolutely always run on different physical hosts. So this, this feature is about providing a way to 
um, control that at the end user. We're going to have some improvements to live migration. Um, currently, if you're live migrating into an open stack, you could have persistent um, storage um, for the virtual instances that is visible on all of the compute types. So we're going to make use of the um, NVD support that was added to GMU in the past year to do um, live migration of storage. So you won't have to have um, shared storage on all of the compute hosts. We're also going to improve the live snapshot facility. Um, currently, live snapshots only capture the disk image state. We don't do anything with the RAM state. So we're going to expand that to also cover RAM state. So you have proper, um, you do proper point in time live snapshots um, of, of guests. And um, the final one that I mentioned here is um, host reservation, where if you're a, um, a user of cloud and you want to reserve a whole bunch of virtualization host resources just for your exclusive use, you'll be able to do host reservations. Although, obviously, I mean, if you're doing a cloud deployment, the cloud administrator may not enable this feature, but if you're doing a private cloud in deployment, for more of a data center um, scenario, then I can see this host reservation being quite useful. That was the last slide I want to talk about um, today. And I know that was a bit of a whirlwind tour of open um, there is a hell of a lot going on in OpenStack, and there's not nearly the time to cover um, all of it in, in a 40 minute talk. Um, so, with that, if there's any questions, I think we've got five minutes to have questions. Um, well, uh, has been work in the overt community recently to actually integrate with some of the open stack services. Um, I must admit I'm not too closely up to date on where the state players with overt, but I believe they've got some integration with um, the image service in, in open stack and with the network service. Um, so they, I think they're, they're able to make use of some of those parts of OpenStack um, to support their um, virtualization host management facilities. Anthony? Okay, I'm going to mention one which I don't want to see personally, but they've brought it up to me. I've got a bigger debate about it. They want to do live VM cloning. They want to take a running instance, and they want to use live migration to create another instance of that machine without shutting down either instance. And I've told them this is insane, and it's, it's not going to work. They had a proof of concept of working, and they said, oh, it works. Let's, let's, let's include this and support it. And I, pointed out all the horrible ways in which it can go wrong. And they said, oh, well, that'll never happen. And I said, yes, it will happen. I don't want to support this. And the KVM guys probably don't want to support this either. But if you, if you say you want to support it, then um, they'd, they'd love to see it. But I told them that we don't want to see it. Because <laughs> there's just so many ways that that can go horribly wrong. Um, Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the stuff that um, is being developed over the past year, doing you like the drive mirroring, image fleecing, that kind of stuff is all fairly interesting to, to OpenStack. I must admit, I'm not too involved in in the storage side of OpenStack, so I don't know what specifically they might want. But that kind of stuff is all interesting interesting to us. Um, but I think I we'll see see us doing more work in resource management and 
SLA related stuff. So that's probably more stuff that Libvirt has to deal with via the kernel and rather than queuing. Um, perhaps better disk encryption support would be useful. Currently, we've got some limited disk encryption support in Nova, um, but we're using Device Mapper and Lux to set up um, block devices. Um, but if we're, connect, if we're having QMU connected to Lux OS directly, we don't necessarily want to have to go via a Device Mapper target for encryption. It'd be nice to encryption on top of any device. Try and get a group photograph of everyone. Uh, we're going to put just outside there um, in the lunch area in front of the panel of glass windows. So we're going to just accumulate, um, move to that area, and we'll try and get a photo of everyone um, if we can. 